<coughs> Tell me when. When? We're ready. Good to see each of you. Uh, Presley and his family, his wife, are about <coughs> four hours away. They should be back tomorrow or the next day. But good to see you. We're in Galatians 3. I want you to look at Galatians 3. <coughs> I want you to look at it from the standpoint of especially the language starting about verse uh, 6 to the end of the chapter. And there are some things in this chapter that are uh, of major significance. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we're grateful for your word that guides us and we pray that you'll help us be wise in our study, judicious that we might understand your will above all, all else, giving ourselves to knowing you and your Son. In His name we pray. Amen. Sometimes we read a book and we forget the context, the historical context in which it was written. In the first century, uh, what the people knew about the Holy Spirit came as a result of what? Strange question, I realize. The manifestation of him? The manifestation of the Holy Spirit. In the first century, the Holy Spirit was being was manifesting himself in not only the preaching of the apostles, but in the miracles that the apostles were able to work, and the miracles worked by those upon whom the apostles laid hands. Uh, Galatia was one of those congregations that was in a region where the Apostle Paul and Barnabas made their first missionary journey. And there you'll find the church being growing and active and you're going to find that they were being guided by the Holy Spirit. Now some read this section, especially the first five or six verses, and they want to talk about us receiving exactly what's being talked about here. Well, that's not the circumstance. The circumstance has to do with the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the miraculous work that was being done among the apostles, or by the apostles, and by those upon whom the apostles laid hands. Uh, they didn't have New Testaments, but what did they have? They had, go ahead. Information from Paul and others regarding the spoken word. They had the spoken word yeah. <clears throat> spoken by men who were guided by the Holy Spirit. And the man upon whom hands were laid, he became not only knowledgeable, but it quickly matured. Now, how do we know that? Jesus said so. Jesus said so, but we also know something else. Typically in our environment, how long does it take a man to grow up to be an elder? Several years multiplied years. In fact, I do not know of very many men who have become elders before they were 42 to 43, and I have known some who became elders as late as 80. Uh, so they're characterized by years, but in the first century, uh, they completed a missionary journey and came back, and along the way, what did they do? They pointed elders. And they could, well, how could that be? because they were being guided by the Holy Spirit, not only in the Word, in what they preached, but in a maturity that was theirs because of the work that they had been given. The work was not simply head knowledge. There was work being done in their hearts and their minds so that their character is being ruled and manifest by their adoration of God in that, in that first century. But that's not the focus of our lesson in this particular uh, point that is made. Uh, I want you to look at some words that are rather familiar, but we're going to talk about an expression found in verse 6. Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. What does that mean? How did Abraham obtain a right relationship with God? Through perfect obedience? Nope. Uh, how did he, and when you talk about righteousness, you're talking about right relationship with God. How did Abraham obtain this righteousness? It was by what? 
It is by faith. Now, we're going to have to do some homework here, but not because we haven't studied this, but because we've not looked at the language possibly the way we should. And while we do not have time to look at all of the passages, in fact, you'd be reading from Genesis chapter 12, the introduction of Abram, all the way down through 25, when you come to the end of his life and the unfolding of the life of Isaac, and you're going to find a number of things with regard to Abraham. Uh, Abraham is introduced to us uh, in exacting language. He is introduced to us as the one whom God called, and he was he lived in what town? Ur. You do Ur if you don't call it Ur. Yeah. Ur of Chaldees. He was in Ur of Chaldees, so he was what? A what? Chaldean. He is a Chaldean. Chaldean. A Chaldean. What in the world is a Chaldean? A Persian. Abraham was not a Jew. That surprised you. <laughs> he is the father of the people that are called the Israelites. But the Israelites are, were Chaldeans, physically. Uh, they are Chaldean or Persians. And Abraham was told, get out of your country, out of your father's house, and go into a land that I will show you. And he left Ur of Chaldees, and he went, first of all, to where? Picking up on your Abraham knowledge. He went to Haran. Haran yeah. He went to Haran, and then he began, he is there for a while, then he goes down and buys a piece of property. The only piece of property we know of that he bought, and it was a place for what? Burial. A place for burial. And you're going to find that his descendants, up through Joseph at least, are brought back. Joseph and Jacob are brought back up there and buried in this in this in this parcel of land. But then he spends, goes down and spends years in what what nation? In Egypt. And then he's called out of Egypt and he comes forward. But you begin dealing with Abraham and you start dealing with this thing with regard to him. Uh, he is justified by faith. But now some rather interesting things with regard to how do we know they had faith? Well, God said, leave this country, leave your father's house, go into a land that I will show you. So he packed up like a hobo and left, right? I use that expression deliberately. Abraham was a wealthy man. He had property and lands and he had all kinds of servants. Uh, he was so wealthy that whenever the armies came down and pillaged and took, who was it, took him captive? Took who captive? His nephew, oh, nephew Lot. Lot took him captive. Abraham saddled up his army and said, let's go, boys. And went with his army and he defeated those kings and rescued Lot. You come back through all of this, though, our thought with regard to Abraham, though, is, is going to be finally forced to look at the language of Galatians 3. Because God made a promise to Abraham that he says in Genesis 12 and 3, what did God tell Abraham? <clears throat> Through your seed, which equals descendants, right. through your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And that was made and Abraham believed God, but time passed, and time passed, and time passed. And he and Sarah get to trying to figure out how God's going to keep this promise, and they sort of ran ahead of God, and they said, well now, she said, now I've got a servant girl, and her name is Hagar. Hagar. And you went go unto her, and she'll have a child, that child will be mine. Now, were they right in their surmisings? Nope. But Hagar did have a child, and his name was Ishmael. Ishmael. And we're still suffering from that. Did you know it? How many nations came out of Ishmael? Twelve. Did you know that? Twelve came out of Ishmael, and they're all Arabs. Yeah. And the descendants of Ishmael are a certain character. And what is it? Islamic. <laughs> it's 
better than that. His hand shall be raised against every man, and every man's hand shall be raised against him. That is the character of the descendants of Ishmael. And the descendants of Ishmael subscribe to a religion that in reinforces the character of Ishmael. The Mohammedans. You think about that. But Abraham is still 100, at 100 years of age. They're still waiting on a child and God, the angels come and God is among them. And they visit with uh, Abraham and Sarah at the Oaks of Memory. And they again tell him that you're going to have a child and the child is going to be with your wife, Sarah, and, or Sarai, which is it? Well, it's Sarai then. It's Sarai then. And she's going to have a child. And when she heard that, she's eavesdropping. When she heard that, what did she do? She laughed. laughed. And she finally had a son. She's 90 years of age. Abraham's 100. She's beyond the uh, age-bearing, uh, child-bearing. But they have a child, and they name it what? Isaac. Isaac. Name it laughter. Mm -hmm. Laughter. Yeah. Named it, named it laughter. The word Isaac means laughter. <clears throat> but you begin looking at all the language. So here's Abraham believing God, going from leaving his father's house, going to a land where he shows him going into Egypt, coming out of Egypt, waiting all these years. And you began to think with regard to Abraham, and there are so many things about Abraham that are a curiosity. Uh, there are some things that are rather puzzling with regard to him. Uh, morally, he was not circumspect. In character, he was weak. But he's still a man that trusted God. And we know that, and we know that with exacting language through what event? Through his, uh, told him to sacrifice Isaac. I mean, God to told him that. to take Isaac and go to a place that he would appoint and to offer Isaac in sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So this poor fellow packed up like a hobo and goes, no, he's rich. He takes not only his son, but he takes his servants. He takes not only... He takes their provision, he takes all the things necessary, and they go down to a place to offer Isaac, although the servants don't know it. But when they get to that place, uh, Abraham tells the servants, my son and I are going to go there and offer sacrifice. And their question is, is what's he going to offer? Does he explain it to them? No. no. They go to that place, do you know the place where they went? The name of the place? Well, this is interesting. I'm going to leave you to study that. It's a specific place, one that is going to, in years to pass, is going to be identified again and again and again in Scripture at that place. And when they get to that place, they build a place for the sacrifice. And Isaac's question is what? Where's the, where's the uh, sacrifice at? The, uh, Where and what is the sacrifice? And what did Abraham say? The Lord, will provide. the Lord will provide. And then he binds Isaac and lays him on the altar and he's ready to offer him. And who stopped him? An angel of the Lord. An angel of the Lord stopped him. And then there is a sacrifice that is made, provided by a bullock that is caught with its head in the bushes, and they take that and offer it in sacrifice. But now, biblically speaking, so far as God was concerned, something unique is established here. When he stays Abraham's hand, he says, I now know that you trust me. Now, I've often thought about the, the, that whole scenario, that whole event. And there's something very large about the expression, Abraham believed God. And I want you to try this on for size. I've got to move. I've got a glare coming right in over your head there. Abraham so com came to a point in life that he so completely trusted God 
Now listen to me carefully and hope this will stick. He so completely trusted God that God took his heart captive. Now you think about that for a moment. Have I overstated the case? He so completely trusted God that God took his heart captive. Now I say that with, for a deliberate reason. The design of the gospel is not so that we will become convinced of certain facts or that we will have a certain emotional response. Those are involved, but that's not all. The design of the gospel is God's design in the gospel was to communicate truths to us that are so valuable, that are eternal, that are spiritual, that the gospel allows God to take our hearts captive so that we come to so completely trust Him that He takes our heart captive. Response to that, John, what do you think? Well, what you just said may be, I don't know if this is important or not, but that may be the only or as close as we can get to understanding what was going through Abraham's heart and mind at that That's time. Right. Yeah. He told his servants, we're going over there to worship mm -hmm. and we will come back. Yeah. But I have often wondered what's going on through his mind as he and his son are building this altar and he's knowing all the while I'm going to lay, lay him up here and tie him up and he's going to cry out to me, what are you doing, Dad? Uh, and it's somewhere in the back of Abraham's mind is he saying, all right, Lord, you can pick up now. You know, you, you can stop me. You know, is, is there any way that we can understand what's going on through his heart and mind? There's this one time. statement. There's one statement. <clears throat> and it is found in Hebrews 11. And this is powerful. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. He speaks of it as an event that was so locked into his mind and purpose that he, in, from every perspective, except the literal act, offered up his son Isaac. Concluding, verse 19, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Hebrews 11, 19 is the only verse in the, New, in the whole Bible that tells us what ruled Abraham's heart and mind in this act. What did Abraham believe? God could do anything. He believed literally that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. And then the Hebrew writer adds this by inspiration from which he also received him in a figurative sense. As far as Abraham was concerned, the son is being is going to be laid there. He's going to be offered. His life blood is going to be shed. And he's going to die right here on this altar. And as far as he was concerned, it was a done deal. He so completely trusted God that God took his heart captive and he was led to do what he did because he trusted God. And there was something that Abraham believed had God suggested to him he would raise him from the dead, there's no evidence of it. But Abraham so believed or trusted that God was able to raise him up from the dead, even from the dead. And then the Hebrew writer says, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What you got sort of a... Uh, a rooted promise that Abraham believed in. That's right. You know, that whatever else happened, he's still going to revert back to rule number one. You know, yeah. God was going to see that he was blessed as long as he followed him. And, yeah. and that he was going to have a seed or, or a line of descendants that had to come somewhere and he'd already established beyond years what could happen. And that would make you grow in faith a little bit right there if you had a son that old and it happened, mm -hmm. you begin to say, well, he, he probably do whatever he, he tells me he's going to do. And, right. You know, so, I mean, that's what it's built on. Yeah. yeah. But uh, God had already established <coughs> what fact. Through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. But what, what had God established 
in, in Abraham's ear and heart. Isaac is that seed line. It's Isaac is the one. It's, it's not through Ishmael. It is through Isaac. But the point that is made in Hebrews 11 is rather succinct to the point that he so trusted God that he believed God was even able to raise him from the dead. But that one verse in Hebrews 11, 19 is the only verse in the entire Bible that even gives us any insight as to what Abraham thought and what he believed. But he so completely trusted God that God took his heart captive and nothing would keep him from doing what God required. Now, when you begin thinking with regard to the purpose of the gospel, that's the nature of the gospel. We do not come in obedience to baptism believing in baptism. We come to, in obedience to baptism trust it because we trust God. We trust God. We rise to walk in units of life, not because we have attained or obtained something, but because we trust God. That's what's going on in our hearts and our minds. And in and, and manner of speaking, it's, it's difficult for us to get a hold of this whole premise, but if the gospel does not take our hearts captive, we can be religious from now on and not be right with God. Uh, we can go, if you will, 90 miles of the way, but not the last 10. We can take a thousand steps, but not the last step. And we may miss ourselves finding the way that God would have us go. Uh, I find myself struggling with this, this whole concept, though. Have I allowed God, am I allowing God to take my heart captive, <coughs> to rule in my heart and my mind? And, uh, you know, I hear, I hear constant reference to the necessity of baptism, and it needs to be emphasized. But in its context, it is an act of, of, of obedience to God that grows up out of one so completely trusting God. <clears throat> this is what God says. I one time saw a bumper sticker says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And the next time I saw it, I saw a fellow who had taken a pencil and a magic marker and he marked through that middle one. God said it, that settles it. And that's where, where Christians are. Uh, I grew up in a religion, the people I dearly love, and I find myself just in agony. How, how do I get across to them that they have sold their souls for a bill of goods? And they're following a doctrine that is uh, popular. In fact, it's uh, multiplied millions embrace that doctrine, but uh, they're not right with God. And you keep hold, what do you keep holding fast to? You keep holding fast to the premises that are going to be set forth here in Hebrews in Galatians chapter 3. Any question or comment on this long introduction? Well, I'm going to put a different sort of a twist on it here yeah. in the dynamic, but you had um, Abraham, you know, you understand his point of view, but Isaac, uh, you think about his situation here now. I mean, uh, what, what goes through his mind? He asks yeah. the yeah. question, but he starts saying, Dad's kind of lost it here, I believe. Yeah, you know, he you know, when he starts wrapping him up, his daddy was. putting him on the altar and all yeah. this, you know, I mean, but he's yielding. Uh, yeah. He wouldn't have been on there. He's a younger man than Abraham. Yeah. He could have fought him off and said, we're not going to do this, you know, or whatever. So you got to think about that perspective as well. And in what you're talking about, um, Isaac demonstrated uh, a yielding nature to his dad, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and respect for him, and maybe God too. It, you know, was a belief in His own heart to some extent. But yeah, well, around these Isaac's faith was, yeah, I guess. No, right. Isaac right. trusted Abraham yeah. as much as Abraham trusted God. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> or was it at least obedient? <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's what's interesting because we're not told anything about Isaac's attitude. Mm -hmm. There's no information given <clears throat> about him or his. His response to but it had to be something along that line. He uh -huh. didn't knock him out or something, yeah. put him on the altar, yeah. or, <laughs> yeah. or something. It yeah. was a, a willing attitude. So yeah. something to be said about that, I guess. Uh, but the the thing that is that is so axiomatic yeah. though is when God says, "I now know that you trust me." Who else knew that he trusted God? Yeah. 
Yeah, you hope Isaac yeah. over overheard that. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Abraham also came to know. Yeah. He came to know that he did trust God, that his heart did belong to God, and where God called, that's where he went, what God said, that's what he did, and that was the life of Abraham. Now, you're looking at a, a section of history in the book of Genesis, and yet when you begin to look at the New Testament, what's the emphasis, even as we begin to look at it here? The emphasis is that we are to be like Abraham. Now, we're going to have Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, then we've got the 12 sons. The tribes will call them that. We've got more, more than that sons. And then how, how much how, in, in that intermix we're going to pick up what individual? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And then we're going to have what? What, who, what man comes on the scene? Moses. Moses comes on the scene. Now, how many years between Abraham and Moses? I ask you a deliberate question because there's a complication in Galatians. How many years was it from the time that God made a promise to Abraham until the law was given? Four and a half, Four. Yeah, four thirty maybe. <laughs> You've got a complication there. <laughs> How long were the people of Israel in, in Egypt? 430. So there was almost 200 years between the time of the promise made to Abraham and the time that Jacob took his family and went down into Egypt. And they are there 430 years and they come out of the land of Egypt and they are given what? The law. Now, why would I bring up that 430 years being a problem? The book of Galatians says that the law was given 430 years after the promise. We've got to do some homework on that, you know. <laughs> We've got to do some homework on it. Uh, the Septuagint says that it was 430 years. Is that what is being referenced here? Uh, is this the accepted time or is there a point in time that is that is obvious? Uh, there's something else to be considered. Was Abraham a king? Was Isaac a king? Was Jacob a king? In fact, when Jacob took the whole clan <clears throat> that were descendants of Abraham through Isaac through Jacob, how many of them went into the land of Egypt? How many? Where would I find out? Well, you'd find out in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter what? Seven. Seven. And he's going to tell you something about how many went down into the land of Egypt. Now there's a miswhack in that number until you realize that there are how many in Egypt that are going to join the number that's already there? Joseph and his sons. They're already in Egypt. But they're numbered with that group that comes in. To, how many are there? So you've got at least 75 or 76 owing to the count. Are they a nation? They have power? Prominence? And they end up being where? Stations where? In Egypt. In the land of Gushin. <coughs> And they became what for the people of Egypt? Herbans. They became herdsmen. They were, you can relate to this, Chuck. They, had, they took care of the cattle. Seriously, they took care of the cattle. And it was preferred that they do so because the Egyptians looked upon cattle as what? From their religious perspective, the cattle were what? Necessary evil. They had to have them to eat, but they should not have any contact with them. Yeah. And, but the people of, of Israel took care of all of that. They were the herdsmen. They took care of the cattle. They took care of all of those things. In time, 
There was a Pharaoh that rose up who did not know about Joseph, and he made slaves out of them, and they were involved in building with mortar and brick and all kinds of things there, but that's not where we're going. The emphasis has to do, we've got to do some work here. God made a promise to Abraham, and I'm going to start now in verse 7. Therefore know that only those who are of faith. Now we've got a complication in, in uh, this section. There's a rather un, uh, obtuse thought to be developed. Those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Now in this context, you're going to have uh, the faith talked about in verse 7. In verse 8, the scriptures, the scriptures. Now what would that have included? What New Testament books? The scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel. Preach the what? The gospel to Abraham. The gospel was preached to Abraham in what sense? Was it preached as fact or as promise? It was preached as a promise. Uh, was it true? Well, if it wasn't true, uh, we're in trouble. But the, Abraham heard the sermon <laughs> and totally, completely trusted God. Vis-a-vis -vis what? <coughs> the gospel preached to him in promise. And the promise was preached. The gospel was preached to Abraham. And what was the gospel according to this text? If we call it the promise, what does the writer of Galatians call it? He calls it the gospel. The gospel was preached to Abraham, and you, in you all nations shall be blessed. Now, how many times are you going to find that statement in the Old, in the Old Testament? Well, you got it in Genesis 12 and 3. You've got it in Genesis 18, 13. You've got it in Genesis 22, 24, 26. The last time it was stated to Isaac, through your seed, and the seed meant descendant, but it's what? Is it plural or singular? Singular. Singular. Stay with it. All the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. One Bible scholar, and I do not pretend to be one, but one Bible scholar said that you serve yourself well if every time you find the expression in the book of Galatians especially, if you will place the definite article, the, in front of the word faith. Well, what is the faith? Well, we'll read some. As many are all the works of the law are under the curse. It is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the law, book of the law, to do them. Tell me about the law. But I don't have to go very far. It was a book. The law did what? What did the law do according to verse 10? The law of Moses, what could it do? Could it justify? Uh, just condemn. It could, all it could do was condemn. It could, it could condemn you only in your actions if you did not do what was required. And it required to continue in all the things written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by the faith. Yet the law is not of the faith but the man who does them shall live by them. Now you've got this language three times in three verses. You have a proclamation, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things written in the book of the law. No one is justified by the law. The law is not of faith, and the man who does them shall live by them. What, what did the law require? The law required what? Across the board of everyone under the law. What did it require? Yeah. Perfect obedience. Perfect, yeah. And it required perfect obedience. And how many passed? Nobody. 
when I was in college, I had a teacher, nobody knew it then, a fine old gentleman, but uh, he was dying and nobody knew it. He had leukemia, he didn't know it. But I suffered from it, <laughs> not knowing he was ill. I took, a, I took a survey of Old Testament and we were responsible for everything from Genesis 1 through Second Chronicles. <coughs> we were responsible for the survey of the Old Testament textbook, almost 500 pages. And we had had two tests and he told us that our final would can't count one half of our grade. Well, I wasn't too upset. I had a B plus going into the final. And we told us we were responsible from Genesis 1 through the book of Second Chronicles and, and responsible for the text. We only had 10 questions on our final. All 10 of them were out of one chapter in Second Chronicles. Passing was 75. I made 74. There were only two who made 76. I got a D for the course. And I missed graduating magna cum laude by five-tenths of a point. There it is right there. Well, you begin looking at the, 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 what he's done to us. He's given us so much obligation with regard to this. Now, you're responsible for Genesis 1 to, through 2 Chronicles. Historically, how much time is that? That's almost 2,500 years. You've got 1,500 years of history in the book of Genesis. You go all the way down through 2 Chronicles. Did it do any good to protest? No. So I didn't. Uh, I felt very bad toward him, upset with him. But we found out the following year that he had come down with leukemia and had very short time to live. It still didn't change my grade. <laughs> but now when you start looking, here, God says, okay, here's what's required. If you're under the law, here's what's required. Everything from Genesis through Revelation, everything contained in the book is you're under obligation, and the emphasis has to do uh, that who, who, do, who does not live by them uh, shall not live. Then he makes this bold proclamation: Christ has redeemed us from what? Curse of the law. Well, now how could he do that if the law is still in force? How could he deliver us from the curse of the law? He became the curse. All right having become a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that's a quotation from what? Deuteronomy. 21? Yeah. 3. And the curse was on everyone who, that the blessings of Abraham might come up upon the Gentiles in Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through the faith. Now he says, brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Okay, we're going to talk about something we can ordinarily understand. What do you know about contracts and covenants? Well, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Uh, I know some folks who have moved into a subdivision, and there are some provisos in their purchase that require them to pay so much a month HOA fees. <clears throat> but if you didn't sign into a contract where you were required to pay HOA fees, guess what? You don't have to do. You don't have to pay the HOA fees, do you? Do you? That's not part of your deal. But if you are, but you 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 do have to honor the terms of your what? Covenants in your neighborhood. Contracts. Mm -hmm. Now put you on the spot. How many contracts have you witnessed or been part in? in your business. Oh, a bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fellow from Texas who say a whole pass a little. Yeah. <laughs> but you look at it this way, if it's only a man's covenant, you draw up a contract when it's confirmed. Mm -hmm. It's a done deal. You don't add to it or take from it. Well, we understand that. Now, not in point of time, but as a matter of fact, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. 
promises. What were the promises? I love this. Genesis 12, what were the promises? I'm going to do what? I'm going to do what? Genesis 12, 1 through 3. You might all turn and look at it. Read it out loud for me. See if you got it. <clears throat> the Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land, and I will show you. I will make it I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples of earth will be blessed through you. Okay, how many promises do you have in Genesis chapter 12? Six or seven there, I guess. You got three. Nope. I'm going to make a great nation of you. you. I'm going to give you a land. And through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Now, how many of those promises were fulfilled? <clears throat> There's a little passage in the book of Judges. Joshua, rather. The last verse of chapter 21. The Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers. <coughs> and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. And the Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. And the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Verse 45. What does it say? A word failed. Of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel all came to pass. Now that particular verse says that the land and nation promise were fulfilled. They're not waiting to be fulfilled. They were fulfilled. What about the seed promise? To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed, and what does the Galatians writer, what does Paul do in verse 16? He identifies what? Christ. Is the, the seed. Lord. The seed is Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, the emphasis is given, he does not say, and to seeds, as of many. Now, do you learn anything here? Just off the cuff? What is singular, you don't make it plural, and what is plural, you don't make it singular. Here's something with regard to the law, the law of silence. God didn't say anything about seeds. He said through your seed. He had something specific in mind. Now if you go back in the Old Testament, you're going to find seed talked about in Genesis 3.15. And the seed in Genesis 3.15 is what? The seed of woman. The seed of woman. Singular. The seed of woman. And the seed of woman is who? The virgin born son of God. You find Genesis 3.15, Isaiah 7.14, you go all the way down to the birth of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. The seed of woman. No man had anything at all to do with the birth of Jesus. He's the seed of woman. He is also the seed of Abraham. He is that one through whom God says, through thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now, the emphasis has to do with the fact that the seed is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years plus <laughs> later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. So you've got the promise made, Genesis 12. You've got the nation promise fulfilled. You've got the land promise fulfilled. But the seed promise was not fulfilled until when? Christ. The birth of Christ. Now, he makes it very, very clear that it was because he, he is the one who was to come and the law was added because of transgressions. What does that mean? Why was the law given? God made a promise 
to Abraham that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Seed line. I don't have time to discuss this. What is Matthew chapter 1 all about, the first 18 verses? The genealogy or the seed line. Now, the generations are spelled out. Why did God require the people of Israel to keep their genealogies? Can we keep the keep them straight as far as who the people are? Why did He give the Why did He give the law? Because they, as a people, were violating God's promises, violating His provisions, and were intermarrying with other nations. Mm -hmm. And God did not forbid the intermarrying with other nations for, but for one purpose. And that purpose was to keep the seed line distinct and specific. And what you have in Matthew chapter 1 is the delineation that God kept His promise. Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah, all the way to the end of it. Now this is curiosity. One third of the book of Genesis is about Joseph. Was he of the seed line? Judah was his brother, and Judah was of the seed line. But Joseph was not of the seed line. What in the world, why in the world we have so much information about Joseph? If it had not been for Joseph, it was kept, it, that's right. And the people of Israel would have never gone into Egypt, and they would have never become a nation. They came out a nation of 1.5 million plus 430 years later. But you got the you got the seed line being kept, and the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. He talks about what a mediator is. Verse twenty one is the law against the promises of God. Certainly not. If the law had if a law had if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. I think we got our second bail. Already? Yeah. I didn't hear it. <laughs> I was starting there, Lord willing, next week. What are you into? Abraham knew that uh, they would come back from the night. He was just, he just, he knew it. He, 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 he said it before. Now, my